We're kicking off a new series today. Uh, series might be not a great name for it. It is uh, four semi-connected, but maybe com- profoundly unconnected messages that I feel like I'm supposed to preach. Uh, it, I'm calling it What's on My Mind and Heart. Uh, and it is the messages that have kind of bubbled up that might not fit in well with another series that might not marry well with something else, but I think we just need to say as a church. And with that, I'm going to ask everyone to do something I've literally never asked anyone ever to do. If this is helpful for you, share it. Because these are messages I'm inviting our community to reflect on, but I also believe our calls for the greater church and our greater social circles. So if you have the willingness, if there is something said that is worth sharing, share it. We put our videos on YouTube, our sermons on the website and audio file. You could make a slide and put it on Instagram or tweet it, um, whatever it might be. And that is not to say I am worth always promoting and shouting from the rooftops, but I think if this is a message that is helpful, share it. Uh, St. Thomas's reach is small when we just hold it into ourselves and agree with the messages that are preached in our community. But I think if we want to bring about greater change, spread that word. That's all I will say about that. I'll probably never say it again. So do with that what you want. But this message is an invitation. Uh, It is an invitation that I think invites us to be something that our country does poorly, our communities do poorly, probably each of us does poorly, if we're honest with ourselves, myself included. Uh, And I'm entitling this message, how many little kids? Be more gracious, you judgmental jerk. Um, there's other words on my slide, but I'd like to be honoring to, uh, to our young people in the room. No need to explain those things on the way home. So anyway, with that and that said, we are really, really, really bad at giving one another the benefit of the doubt. I am bad at it. Probably all of you are bad at it. Collectively as a culture, we are bad at it. If you aren't, you just get to sit back and judge everyone in the midst of this sermon. But if you are, like me, bad at believing the best in one another, especially in those people you disagree with, this message is for you. I think we are being ripped apart as a country because we are incapable of believing the best in one another. The way you vote is because you hate people, not because you think of politics differently. The way you live or buy clothes or shop is because you actively want to destroy the world, not because that fit shirt fits better or you like the taste of that burger. We have to find a place to see one another as well-meaning humans and then go forward from there to have any chance of not exploding. I have talked to so many congregants in the last years who have lost friends because the circle of what's off limits has gotten so small that friendships are hard to hold together. That is not just a failing of those friendships or a shortcoming of one of those people. That is our culture of not believing the best in one another and believing the absolute best in ourselves. And so I want to look at three foundational frameworks of what Christianity is and invite them into the conversation of how we believe the best in one another. Love, humility, and forgiveness. And to that end, I want to look at, well, actually four passages uh, of Scripture that invite us to think about those things. So first, love. There's probably no more popular passage on love than 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. It isn't jealous. It doesn't brag. It isn't arrogant. It isn't rude. It doesn't seek its own advantage. It isn't irritable. It doesn't keep a record of complaints. It isn't happy with injustice, but it is happy with truth. Love puts up with all things, trusts in all things, hopes for all things, endures all things. Love puts up with all things. It trusts in all things. It hopes for all things. Actor Ian McShane plays bad guys all the time. It's his favorite characters to play. He loves playing bad guys. And he says this, I love playing the villain because I know that he doesn't believe he is the villain. I don't approach any villain as if they were the villain. I approach them as if they believe they are the good guy in their own stories. 
that allows him to bring complexity to the villains of the world in a way that makes them worth fighting against or believing or feeling empathetic towards or whatever else it might be. He tells the story of an old Catholic homily that says that when Jesus dies and ascends into heaven, Judas is sitting on the right hand of the Father because someone had to play that part to finish the rest of the story. So when he reimagines Judas as the guy that is called to do this and not this evil bad man, Judas gets a whole different place in the, the cloud of witnesses than we often put him. We have to believe that out of our love for one another, they might be operating out of love as well. That if we believe that we are operating out of a place of love and that they are operating out of a place of love, even when there is a chasm in between us on how that might look, we are starting on common ground. No bad guy thinks they're the bad guy. I love the, what movie is it? Are we the baddies? Uh, if anyone knows it. But it, there's something about that, like, we, no one thinks they're the bad guy, including the person you think is the bad guy. So what if you believe, out of love, that they aren't the bad guy? Next one, humility. There is no point in love without humility. The greatest of all the humility passages, first, or Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. What would it look like if we were to able to regard others as better than us? Or, maybe more on point, regard others' opinions as better informed than our own? What would it look like to regard others' beliefs as equal to our own? What would it look like if we trusted that their holding of the world might see something that we don't and thus is more true or accurate. That doesn't mean we end up having to agree with them once we've done the work, once we've come to it, but starting from a place of I might be wrong instead of I know I am right changes the way we approach one another. If we do not have humility, is there any point in any of this? If we do not have humility, there is no path towards one another that I can imagine. Folks, we have to be humble. Third, most important probably, you know, two passages. Oh, Jeremy, can we go to the Matthew one first and then the Colossians? Sorry about that. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I mean, this is a terrifying passage. If you start from the point of like, if you don't forgive people, like, if you extrapolate this out in the frameworks we start with, if you don't forgive people, you go to hell, right? Like, that's, that is the lens and the framework Jesus is speaking into. But I think that's a complex thing to hold and say, and Donald Hegner says it this way, that I think is much, much more helpful and much less threatening. Donald Hegner is a New Testament scholar, Dallas Theological Seminary. These verses are a forceful way of making a significant point that is unthinkable or impossible, that we can't enjoy God's forgiveness without in turn extending our forgiveness towards others. It's not actually about that you are not forgiven if you don't forgive others. It is that if you recognize how forgiven you are, you will extend forgiveness to others. This comes back to humility in a lot of ways. By recognizing that I have blown it regularly throughout the whole of my life, and that both the God of the universe has made steps to forgive me, and those that are in my life have forgiven me and stayed in relationship with me, how can I not extend that same forgiveness to others? There's this call for us to choose to forgive. Again, that doesn't mean always reconciliation of relationship. That doesn't mean healthy and safe boundaries can't be established. But if we do not start from a place of loving, humble forgiveness, I see no way forward. When we believe that you are mean, it is hard to love. When we believe that I am right, it's hard to listen. And we when we believe that you've gone too far to come back, 
There's just no journey towards one another. I want to come back to this last passage that I put in the wrong order. Colossians 3 sums up everything I've just said. Paul is much pithier than I am. Sorry about that. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. I love this bear with one another. Hi, Charlotte. I love the idea of bearing and holding. The other word that we use and Paul uses when we translate bear from Greek is endure. Endure with one another. That to me says something really clear. The goal isn't giddiness to see one another. The goal isn't all relationships are easy and fun and life-giving. The goal is sometimes we just endure one another's presence because we believe in the harmony that is the result. It wouldn't feel like a great step if I said, Becca, I love you, and she said, Matt, I endure you. But what a more honest way of us choosing to be a community together. There ought to be people in our churches that we endure because it means we are reaching people and looking at people and being around people that aren't us. And what a gift, because the result of that is perfect harmony. Not harmony where there isn't conflict. Clearly there is conflict if you're writing this to any church. Not harmony where everyone is on the same page, because clearly they aren't if they're constantly having to forgive one another. But a harmony that comes from taking one another seriously, as C.S. Lewis says, a harmony that comes from radical love, incredible humility, and almost unending forgiveness, or unending forgiveness. Eugene Peterson ends 1 Corinthians 13, I don't have this slide up there, so don't panic, ends 1 Corinthians 13 translating it this way, trust steadily in God, hope unswervingly, love extravagantly. If there are any words that I long for our country, but more for our community to embody, it is a steady trust, an unswerving hope, and an extravagant love, both in the God of the universe, but also in one another. Because when we do that work, we believe the best in one another. We have the ability to move towards someone we disagree with. This new result of mask mandates is like created to bring division in some way, in some brutal force of, hey, you can take your mask off if you have these things done, and then, but we'll put no guidance on it, or we'll put frameworks on it that feel like invasions of trust or whatever else it might be. If we are not trusting the best in one another, if we are not choosing to love one another first, if we are not admitting that we might not know the whole truth of it, it will blow every community apart that aren't the most complete echo chambers. But if we trust steadily in God and in the image of God in one another, if we hope unswervingly in the resurrection and in our own and our brother and sister's ability to do the loving thing, if we love extravagantly, regardless of how much they agree with us, then it doesn't matter what comes down the pipe that could bring division. It will bring perfect harmony. Church, I don't have very much hope for this universe if we can't figure this out. We meaning St. Thomas, and we meaning the church in Oregon, and we meaning the church universal. Because if we, the people whose whole thing is based on undeserved forgiveness, can't figure out how to trust and love and care for our neighbors, what hope does anybody else have? Let's pray. Jesus, this is a message that is easy to yell at people and really hard to internalize. It is easy to expect them to believe they might be wrong. Well, I know that I am right. 
It is easy to expect them to forgive me when I mess up, but to hold a grudge when they drop a ball. It's easy for me to expect them to see that I am lovable while really not believing that they are. So Jesus, I pray, first and foremost, Spirit, that you will help me live out this message. And then, secondly, Spirit, that you will help us live out this message. May we be people who believe the best in one another. And may the result of that be perfect harmony. I don't even know how to imagine what that could look like anymore. But I trust in you steadily. And I'm going to hope unswervingly in your ability to bring about unity again. And by golly, I'm going to do my best to love people with your help. Guide us. In your name, amen.